Quinn. Hi. Thank you so much for staying up later. I'm Paul Provenza. I'm filling in for Bob Costas, who is off rehearsing his one-man show. Um... <laughs> Lincoln, the man, the tunnel. It's a fine show. Don't miss it. And we have an audience with us this evening, which we're glad to have. And uh, I hope you at home will enjoy as much here in the studio as we will our guest this evening. He is an Italian from Australia. What is that about? <laughs> Throw some more calamari on the bobby. I don't know. But he is a very talented actor whose star is on the rise in a big way with great velocity. If you do not know his name yet, you will very shortly. Please welcome Anthony LaPaglia. Anthony, pleasure, please. Anthony LaPaglia. Yes. It is LaPaglia. Is uh -huh. it mis mispronounced often? All the time. As LaPaglia? LaPaglia, 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 you name it. I get it. I, I, I have to, it's so funny, an Italian from Australia. I, now, I was very surprised to learn that you were from Australia. There is absolutely not a hint of your not being from Brooklyn. It, it, it's remarkable. It's more, it's more when I work, I really kind of concentrate on the, on the accent, but in my personal life, I tend to slip into Australian every now and then if I get really mad or pissed off. I or think I need to hear that. You, need to, you have to make me mad. I think, well, the night is young. <laughs> <laughs> have you met my friends from Milwaukee? <laughs> <laughs> They're making me mad. You're right. <laughs> I, I, I do not believe that you are from Australia. No, well, actually, nobody. Uh, when I first started and I first uh, came to the States, I used to go to meetings and I had a very broad Australian accent. And um, I'd been working on an American accent for work. And uh, I would go into a meeting um, with the Australian accent. And because I look like I'm from Brooklyn or New York or whatever, um, they would, uh, uh, they'd say, do like a double take. And they'd say, can you, can you really do like an American accent? Because they think that all Australians look like Paul Hogan. So uh, I would go and I'd do an audition. And um, I would speak to them with an Australian accent. And then I would launch into the... And every single time they'd say, ah, it's very good, but I can still hear your Australian accent. So I started to lose a lot of parts. Mm -hmm. And so finally, one day I just said, oh, I'm going to lie. <laughs> I'm going to lie. I'm from New York. I don't know. And uh, so I started going into meetings and they'd say, where are you from? I'd say, uh, Brooklyn. They'd go, great. Okay, let's read. And uh, that was it. And I just uh, started getting parts. Having lost the accent so completely, yes. how did you do it? I actually, I, I, I decided that I was going to lose it, and then I thought, I'll do it the right way. I'll go see, like, a phonetics guy. A coach. Coach. Yeah. And they have this phonetics, and I didn't understand what the guy was talking about or what was going on, and I figured if I tried to do it that way, I would never get it. So I basically just went out, got a double cassette player, um, rented movies like, you know, Dog Day Afternoon. This is where I got the accent. Dog Day <laughs> Afternoon and movies like that. And I would tape segments, you know, little speeches off of these kinds of movies. And I would take that speech, put it in one cassette, listen to it, then repeat it into the other one, play it back, listen, then keep repeating back and forth. And gradually over a period of... That together with getting in cabs in New York. <laughs> Where do you want to go, you know, if you said, you know... Oh, then you would have come here with an accent like, I can go through the park. I cannot go through the park. <laughs> the park is closed. The park is closed. <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> but making yourself understood in New York on the street was very important, you know. When I first came out here, people thought I was speaking like Martian. I guess know? Dog of the Afternoon is a nice way to ease into it because it's really easy to learn how to say, Attica! 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 Attica. Attica. Exactly. <laughs> I love that movie. Oh, man. Yeah. I want to talk about the, the, the new movie you have coming out. I married, so I married an axe murderer. Yeah. Uh, Mike Myers' new film. Uh -huh. And you play his sidekick, as it were. Yeah, best friend yeah, slash best friend. sidekick. Uh, you've been playing a lot of gangsters, a lot of cops. Uh -huh. And here you get to play sort of the comic side of a cop. Uh -huh. uh, what drew you to that role? You go through cycles as an actor. It's weird. I mean, I started out doing gangsters. And then for some reason it went 
I went to the other side of the law. Which, by the way, I find interesting that for some reason the same actors tend to play cops and gangsters. Well, I think that's because I don't know what that says about cops and gangsters. Yeah. Between the two. <laughs> There's not much difference between them sometimes. <laughs> but, um, uh, I, and it becomes very cyclical. So you do one cop role, and then people think of you in that, well, like people who are in a position to hire you right. start thinking, hmm, you can't do gangsters, he plays cops. But he played gangsters before. Uh, not in his last movie, you know, and it, go, it kind of goes like that, you know, and, and then you'll do something that'll kind of, or it's the same with drama versus comedy. Mm -hmm. You're either right. perceived as, there's a great tendency in, in, I'm not the first person to say it, but there's a great tendency in Hollywood that you are your last movie. Yeah. And, 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 and less, but there are certain people within the industry who kind of go, no, the guy's an actor. And therefore, we can give him a job as an actor. And he'll but, but as you well know, there are many actors who are, excel at drama and have a lot of problems with comedy, and vice versa. That happens. I have a tremendous amount, especially after working on Axe Murderer, I have a tremendous amount of respect. I think more than I had before for comedians and what they do, because they work in a way that is absolutely diametrically opposed to how I work. You know, I, I come from more like the, the uh, you know the stage school where you mm -hmm. where you prepare. <laughs> you know, you actually prepare, and and you like you learn your lines, and you and you know the scene. Oh, pshaw! Pshaw! Who needs that? That's exactly that's exactly kind of the attitude. On like on Axe Murderer, it would be you know um, I'd learn my scene maybe weeks in advance or whatever, just to get it out of the way, and I'd get to the set, and it, you'd just be stepping in front of the camera, and be like, excuse me, here's a new scene, mm -hmm. and you know mentally I would kind of like go, I yeah, I can't do it because I need to look at this and... And along would come Mike Myers, who will just improvise something new anyway. Mike is like the master of improv, yeah. <clears throat> and he can just make something out of nothing just like yeah, that. Yeah, he's remarkable. And so I really kind of actually learned a lot on that, like Phil Hartman and Stephen Wright are in the movie, and Charles Grodin and, and you know, Alan Arkin. I mean, a lot of funny people. Tony, have you heard of this? Mrs. X. She murders her husbands on their honeymoons, then changes her identity and marries again. No, I never heard of it. So what? I think I'm dating Mrs. X. Charlie. Two words. Therapy. Having played a comedy in uh, Axe Murderer, is yeah. that something you want to do more of? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm kind of a, you know, hired gun. I'd, I'd, I'll, I'll do whatever, whatever... I mean, will you go out of your way to do more comedy? Is it something that really juices you? The way playing well, the tough guys does. Uh, yeah, I really enjoy it. going to work doing a comedy is a whole different mindset. You actually, it I is. actually have more fun. Yeah. When I go to work, because if I'm doing a drama and I go to work, I tend to be like if I'm playing like a killer or something like that. I tend to be in that frame of mind <laughs> for most of the shoots. Should we worry? Uh, uh, we're not playing any killers <laughs> right now, uh, but uh, I tend to get in the frame of mind of the character. I mean, I don't live it out. No, of kill people. Not. But I, I tend to be in that frame of mind. And when I'm doing a comedy, I go to work and I'm, I know I'm going to have fun. I know I'm going to laugh. And so that's how I go to work. And, um, and, and it is sometimes just a lot more enjoyable. Uh, and 29th Street, uh, which was a real sleeper, a terrific movie. Mm. Um, you had a really nice arc. You went from being 18 to how old in that movie? 18 to about 30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. and, uh, the and... The 30 was easy, the 18. <laughs> and you hit so many good. interesting notes along the way. I mean, the, ar mm. the arc of that character is so interesting. And uh, it's, a, it's a good movie. Uh, um, it was well-received, although not well-promoted, I don't think. No, it was, it was really... Um, and that was your first big break, wasn't it? Your big first that starring was my, role? That was my first, you know, uh, shot at a starring role in a movie. So, obviously, you know, I had a lot of expectations um, set you do unfortunately you shouldn't have expectations set up but you can't help it you put so much work and time into a piece and and it becomes it becomes your baby to a degree you really love it you know yeah, and sure. and then when it comes out and you see that it's just basically disregarded um, it's very difficult I mean I actually had so much fun working on that movie and working with George Gallo who is a tremendously gifted guy he He's wrote Midnight, yeah he wrote Midnight Run mm -hmm. and he also wrote and directed this and he's a tremendously gifted man. And everybody, it was one of those really special movies where everybody put their heart and soul into the movie. Um, for those in our audience who have not seen 29th Street, tell us a little bit about what that movie's about. 29th Street is actually based on a real guy, uh, a guy named Frank Pesh, 
who was uh, um, one of the first finalists in one of the first New York State lotteries. And um, a majority of the story is really based on what happened to him. Uh, once he was basically kind of a, you know, uh, a hangabout guinea in, uh, in, um, in Brooklyn or Queens, actually. And uh, he uh, had no direction in life and then was all of a sudden the finalist in the lottery. His entire life changed because people thought he was going to win. It's interesting because it is somewhat Capra-esque. Yeah. And what's interesting about it is that a guy winning $6.2 million in the lottery and being upset about it, you know, is how the, how the movie starts. Yeah. yeah. And then you find out, well, what would possibly make somebody upset about winning $6.2 million? It's a, it's a really fascinating little movie. Very yeah. well done. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was really kind of an ambitious project that, that yeah. uh, we, we shot. We shot entirely in North Carolina. Get out. Not one lick of All those shot. scenes in Queens? They, they built Queens in North Carolina. To the point wow. where they were, I, I went to Talk the, about an exercise in futility. I, um, <laughs> I went to the set one day, and they were sowing leaves on trees. They were literally... And then you wonder why movies cost $40 million. That's exactly right. Well, they did this one cheap. They were cheap leaves. <laughs> uh, you worked with Danny Aiello, your co-star in yeah, this movie. Yeah, uh, That must have helped you lose your accent, because I've spent time with Danny, and when you're with Danny for more than five minutes, you become Danny Aiello. You do. <laughs> you start talking <laughs> like this! <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Danny has the most energy of any actor I've ever worked with. He's just all-encompassing, you know, and you just get sucked in. Were there any similarities in that character and anything that you've experienced in your life? Because the character does have a, a rich family life. There was, there was a lot of similarities in terms of the, the relationship, the father-son relationship that I had with Danny. Mm -hmm. There were similarities that, that I connected with in terms of relationship with my father as well. Was that an Italian thing? Uh, I think it's universal, actually. Yeah. I don't even think it's an Italian thing. But there is pressure on, you know, there is, is uh, as Italian families tend to exert a certain amount of pressure on their sons in terms of how successful they're going to be. I think especially like first generation Italians, they want their children to be so much better off than what they were. Mm -hmm. and they want them to be more educated and they want, they want nothing but the best for them so they apply great a great deal of pressure to their kids. Maybe I could become an astronaut. It's the last frontier, Pop. An astronaut? Well, think about it. Look, Pop, I could become the first Italian on the moon. <laughs> don't, don't, don't laugh. I want to, I want to do things that I've never done before. Oh, I see. Well, why don't you try going inside and cleaning up your f***ing room? <laughs> Come on, Pop, I'm serious. I got, I got longings and desires like everybody. Are you all right? Is there, is there little people going around in your head or what? Are, are you putting me on? Huh. Well, be, you see, because I'm talking about reality here, Frankie. Reality, you get it? I'm trying to move us to Queens, and you're talking about picking up f***ing moon rocks. Well, you know what your problem is, Bob? Yeah. What's my problem? Your dreams are too small. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ow. So that was your first starring role, but yeah. um, you, the first role that got you significant attention was in Betsy's Wedding. Uh huh. And how did that come about? Well, that that was really luck. I mean, I, I was. I'm curious how an Italian guy from Australia comes to America, bingo! All of a sudden, this great plum little juicy role in a uh, movie incredible like amount Wedding. of luck. I was in New York. Uh, I'd been doing a play here uh, called Bouncers, which was about four London bouncers. And at the time, I had white hair and was doing all these British dialects and Scottish dialects. It's this weird play where you play 30 characters between four guys. And um, some casting people had come to see the play and had liked my work in that play. And um, the one casting woman in particular, Mary Cahoon, uh, here in New York, had become kind of a fan. And she started bringing me in for things. And she called me one, I remember it was like a Friday morning, and said, look, um, Alan Alda has just written a script, and he's asked if I could organize some actors to come in and simply do a reading around a table so he can listen to it and then go and do rewrites. She said, it's not a job, so don't, you know, get excited or anything. It's just do me a favor and come and read this. Mm -hmm. We read through the script twice, and Martin Bregman, who was the producer of it, was there, 
and Alan Alda was there. And basically, after the second reading, they both came up to me and said, we love what you did with that. Do you want to do it? Wow. And up to that point, I had a hard time getting to look at movies at all. I was doing mm -hmm. theater out here, but mm -hmm. nobody would really give me a shot at movies. And I thought, sure, fine, whatever you say. I didn't believe them, you know. So two weeks went by, and I hadn't heard anything. And then in, after two weeks, um, they called my agent and said, okay, we want to offer him the job. I was in complete shock. So what would you like? I'm extremely interested to know what you enjoy eating. You are? I think about you all the time. I hope that doesn't offend you. I listen to the radio and I think, what kind of music does she like? Hard rock, easy listening. Or maybe she likes classical music, like Sinatra. Last night, I was looking at my plate during dinner, and I thought to myself, does she like veal and peppers with olive oil? Or does she like it with gravy? Like, these are the things that go through my head. So what would you like? To make anything that you want. Well, I just like a little salad and some pasta with tomato and basil. Tomato and basil? Tomato and basil, that's beautiful. More information. So what do you have coming up? What, what are the next projects um, in the works? Um, uh, at, um, currently working on a, a movie with uh, Scott Glenn and um, Laura Flynn Boyle called Past Tense for Showtime. And I'm about to start filming The Client with uh, Joel Schumacher is directing it, mm -hmm. who directed Falling Down. It's John Grisham novel? Uh, yes, it is. The guy wrote The Firm. And the guy who wrote The Firm and The Pelican Brief. By the way, he has a couple hundred dollars in the bank now, I think. Uh, yeah, 3.7. Uh, <laughs> not that I was counting. But, uh, it, uh, and it's got Susan Sarandon in it and Tommy Lee Jones. And, it's a great company. Yeah, and then I do another one after that uh, with Mimi Rogers and um, Peter Boyle and Matt Craven called Bulletproof Heart in Vancouver. This is very exciting even just hearing about this because really this is happening very quickly for you now, isn't it? it relatively, yes. It, it's kind uh, of... Did you ever moment. imagine anything like this? No. Not even the slightest, in the deepest heart of hearts, go, I came out, I'm going to be a movie star? No, I came out to do, the, I came out, basically I was like a misdirected youth. And my attitude always was, if anything comes out of this, it's gravy. It'd be fantastic. If I work, it'll be a miracle. And <laughs> if anything more than that happens, it'll be fantastic. Has it affected your life? Um, you know, because very often when this kind of stardom or this kind of level of success happens so rapidly, it kind of throws people for a loop. You get knocked off balance. Have you had a problem with that? Um, it's kind of relative. Uh, n not really. Uh, um, in some respects, I, it's actually taught me a lot. Because the more success that I get out of this, the more I realize that other things in my life are important. It, it's, it, you know, like, for example, you know, I was working, I've been working a lot for the last four years, pretty much back to back, either doing movies or theater or whatever. I was just very dedicated to, to, to career. And as a consequence, personal life went to hell. And kind of... Relationship, marriage? Yeah, uh, I was married. Were you married? Yeah, I was married. And, and, uh, and that, that kind of went south. And, and, and I attribute a lot of it to career uh, on both parts. Um, was it obsession with your career and your art, or was it uh, sort of an ego motivated thing that hey i 'm starting to you know i 'm starting to get recognition now and it was never it was never ego motivated it was more what happens is there 's a lot of time on the road and time apart and it's, as you it's spend an interesting thing because when, when does that become you know when does that become a problem when does that just become i 'm an artist and i 'm so incredibly dedicated to what i do that's that 's a tough balance it 's a tough balance you yeah. have to decide at a certain point what 's important you know what is really important in your life. And, and what happens is if you're working a lot, the actual quality of your life, it's like taking the train ride to somewhere and not looking at the scenery as you get, you know, you're more interested in getting there than actually looking at what's happening mm -hmm. to you as you're going. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of hit ahead about, about a year ago. And I kind of backed off it and, and, and have kind of have a better perspective on my career in that I've, I've gone back to what I used to think, which was, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If it's not, it's not. And, uh, and, and I really, really believe that. And, you know, consequently, as soon as I started thinking that way, 
you know, my personal life got much better. You know, I met someone, got engaged, and, you know, very much in love and all that stuff. And, and uh, uh, the quality of my life just, you know, drastically improved. The other thing is that I never moved to L.A. I stayed here. <laughs> which improves the quality of your which life. Which absolutely right off the bat. does, yeah. And, and the only other thing that comes out of it is, is you know, is that, you know, is obviously financially your life is, is easier. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not living in a, in, in a, in a, in a, in a bathroom in, uh, on the East Village somewhere, you know. Putting shoes on smelly feet. Oh, or elbowing cockroaches out of the way and all <laughs> that stuff. And you just, you start to have a lot more freedom as a person, you know. Yeah. But you have to really, there's this whole thing about once your career gets going, um, you start, a lot of actors start to panic. It's like, I have to keep it going because it's going to go away. Yeah. You know, a lot of actors feel that. And I think that it's really important that you pull back from that and kind of be more fatalistic about it. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If it's not. Anthony LaPaglia, thank you for being here. Flew in all the way from L.A. just to be here with us tonight. The new movie is So I Married an Axe Murderer. Yep. Opens this Friday with mm -hmm. Mike Myers. Do not miss it. I'm Paul Provenza. Bob Costas will be here next week. Thanks for staying up later. Good night.